Welcome to Geared for Growth. I'm your host, Mike Mortlock, Managing Director of MCG Quantity Surveyors. Today, I've got a very good friend of mine and special guest, Kimberly Ackerman from Trelease Associates. And we're talking all about how to improve your property's performance. This is a question that we got from a listener and a question that Kimberly gets quite a lot. She talks to us about a quadrant where we're looking at things like forced value, capital growth, gearing, cash flow. And she talks about the concept of there being no tax on savings, which I think is a really interesting and poignant one. It's a great interview with Kimberly about how to improve your performance as the business manager of a portfolio, as well as how to improve individual properties within your portfolio. And it's something that I think people should review with their portfolio or their property on a regular basis. It's an awesome interview with Kimberly, and I'm sure you're going to get something out of it. Here's Kimberly. Kimberly Ackerman, thanks for joining me on Geared for Growth. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And I must say, if anyone is wanting to download the best and brightest wisdom in a video format, the Property Bible is something that they should check out. B-U-Y-B-L-E, is that right? Yes, a bit of a play on words <laughs> with that, with the buyer's agent yep. role. Got that one. Yep. So uh, you were kind enough to invite me to that. So this is like a little bit of a sort of a swapsy, but you're here on merit regardless. And we're talking about a very important topic, and that is how to improve your property your property's performance. And that's something we've actually had people write in saying, we wouldn't mind someone talking about this topic. And you mentioned you've actually had people ask about this yourself as well. Yeah, I was actually just talking to a client about it this morning and um, there's so many layers to it that, you know, we'll try and keep quite brief and quite short. I know we we don't have three days to talk about this topic, (laughs) but um, I think it's definitely a good one at the moment and definitely very helpful for a lot of investors out there who are maybe stagnant in the yep. performance at the moment. And and typically the the person that asked you about this what can you explain a little bit about their situation are, are we talking about sort of people that own one property trying to get to the second or a bigger portfolio where they're just kind of thinking look interest rates are starting to kill me i need to try and squeeze a little bit more value out of this rather than just naked profiteering from the tenants you know i want to do an equity uplift what what are we talking can you frame it for us Yeah, so um, this particular example was uh, really just a client that we bought for only a few days ago, an investment property. And they were kind of exploring with the cash flow situation, how they can manipulate that. And I guess over time and going forward, what are the types of things that they can do to try and improve the property's performance now that we have it on their portfolio? The property is already performing great. Um, but I think it's a good thing to explore because there's so many ways to skin a cat, as they say, Mm. and there's always, you can always do better in so many different areas and sectors of this. It's an awful metaphor really, isn't it? I've never skinned a cat myself and I assume that- that Sorry, I don't know. I never say that. I don't (laughs) know I said that. Surely there's (laughs) limited ways as well. Anyway, that's getting a bit too (laughs) gruesome. But let's, let's, let's talk about that metaphor without mentioning it again. What, what, what are the, (laughs) sorry that, yeah. Sorry to any cats <laughs> listening out there. Uh, what what are the ways that you can actually improve the the portfolio's performance, or, or let's say an individual property's performance? Yeah, so I was I was really having a good think about this because I like to explain things as simple and you know as also metaphorical as, as possible when we're going through this process. But I think the two big things to think about that are overarching here are obviously your earnings and your savings when it comes to investment property. And obviously when we're talking about improving a property's performance, we're talking about money. How much money can we make and how much money can we save during this time? Um, So those are the two real overarchings, the earnings and the savings side of things. And if we kind of funnel down into the different layers of that, because that, that can sort of go on forever, but I like to think of it in in four different quadrants, I guess you'd say. Um, two of those at the top are more the asset value. So, you know, your capital growth and any forced value you can add through renovations and, and so, forth, so on and so forth. And then the two quadrants at the bottom are the, the gearing and the cash flow side of things. So, you know, your income and expenditure 
versus your tax benefits. Mm. So those are the four areas that I like to tell investors to focus on. And there's so much in those four areas to chat about, but yep. we're going to try and keep it as brief as possible. No, that's as good. possible I've, today. I've drawn a little quadrant there, but I, I want to yeah. I want to sort of circle back a little bit because when we're talking about uh, improving your property's performance, we're, we're, I guess we're talking about the business of property investing. And you've you've raised a good point about you you know your earnings via versus your savings, right? So. If we're thinking about property specific, we're like, oh, we can do a reno or we can up the rent or maybe we can renegotiate our interest payments or something like that. But you're actually going back more to the beginning and treating it a little bit more like a business and saying, well, if your business is investing in property, it would be great if you could earn more money, right? Because then you've got more more to borrow. I hadn't really quite yeah. thought about it like that. Yeah. And I think people focus so much on the earnings as far as the performance and less on the savings of the property. And to be frank, I mean, um, any earnings we make on on any business, we pay tax on. Mm. We don't pay tax on savings. We just save it. Mm. <laughs> so it's a really great way to frame the investment side of things because, um, and we're going to obviously dig a little bit deeper into these different layers or these different quadrants that we're talking about that, People should really, really hone in on the savings side because the earnings is, I find, like the core and then the savings is like the working smarter, not harder Mm. side of it, Yeah, in, in my opinion. I like that. No tax on savings. Yeah. That's very that's yes. very poignant. There's a quote card coming up with your face and, and name on it um, very soon on that one. That's a good one. <laughs> Let, let's talk about the savings. So, so how do we save? Are we talking about saving personally or saving with the property? Let's, let's, let's say there are yeah. expenses. Maybe you're getting yard work done on a quarterly basis yeah. instead of a yearly basis and there's a saving. What are we talking about? Yeah, so if we we hone in on those four quadrants, really, I mean, the first thing when we talk about is capital growth performance. That's one thing. Now, that's more a before the fact side of analysis. You know, you're going to be looking at purchasing and pinpointing properties in particular areas. They're going to help you with that capital growth side of things. There's only so much influence we have over the capital growth side of things. And so it's more sort of like a preparation before the fact type quadrant, I guess you'd say. If we go over into the like forced value side of things, we're talking about renovations and, um, you know, adding value through improvements on the property. Um, I'm a big advocate of renovating for property. I've renovated many houses and apartments of my own and my own investment property. And I really think if done very efficiently and properly, which comes into the saving side of things, that this can improve your property, not only from an overall value perspective, but from a rental perspective, you know, equity perspective, all of those things in one. Yep. So would you would you describe that as a as a saving? So I suppose if more money's coming in and you've got the same uh, interest rate, let's say you're not having to borrow extra for the reno, or even if you are, the extra rent is more than covering that. Covering that is it a saving or is it kind of both? So I think, well, in my opinion, the savings comes into the process of the renovations and how efficiently you do it. Yep. Um, I know when I've done renovations in the past, sometimes I get up to six quotes for a trade. Um, And that doesn't mean I choose the cheapest one. We also want like quality to be a factor here. But um, I think the savings part of that is, you know, people get really carried away when they do renovations. And I know this is like a whole nother topic that we could talk about, but doing renovations based off of emotional value and look, those tiles look nice. And and I I think I want to do that and less on what's actually going to add value to my property and what's actually going to push my rental income Mm. up, I guess you'd say. Yeah, anytime um, anytime you're looking at something thinking that that looks nice or that sort of feels nice it's it's the wrong it's the wrong approach, isn't it? It's not a business approach, it's an emotional approach. Yeah, you can have nice things but um still not pay an arm and a leg for them. Mm-hmm. It gets to a point where it doesn't make sense to do some things, some things it's it's best to have a blank canvas and just have a nice tidy rental property. And so there's a lot of 
you know, we're talking about improving a property. Um, that is a big portion, this particular quadrant that we're talking about, the adding improvements through renos, renovating for profit and those sorts of things. Yep. Let's go with a, a case study and, and perhaps something that a lot of people uh, can relate to. I'm thinking a, a, a property of my own where it's, um, in all honesty, it's probably due for a reno. I'm just waiting for a little bit of a vacancy period. You know, it's been probably marginally cash flow positive and as interest rates go up and rents going up, maybe it'll land, you know, here or there. The capital growth is good, but it's kind of like, yeah, it, it, it probably could do with a makeover in a number of different ways. What, what do you what do you see as the low hanging fruit to get that to from something that is you know an okay p- property within the portfolio to one of the high performers? The Give for Growth Property Investing Podcast is presented by our business MCG Quantity Surveyors. If you're an investor or a property professional looking to get the best tax depreciation deductions for yourself or your clients, please get in touch with us at mcgqs.com.au. It's our mission to help as many property investors as we can to maximise their claims and maximise their property education as well. Yeah, I think the first thing is really looking at whether or not it's the type of property that deserves a renovation. Right. Like, is it going to add value? Like if your property is doing okay, it's earning okay rent and adding value through maybe a 20 or 30 K renovation, for example, just to spruce things up a bit. If it's not really going to change the rental income much, and if it's not going to add a more equity than what you're putting into it, I probably wouldn't do anything. To that, it. That's a good point, but, um, isn't it? So, like, could we could we look at say comparable renovated properties in the area and say, well, how much more rent are they getting, and how much more are they selling for, and is yeah. it more than twenty or thirty grand, and is it more than twenty or thirty a week, and 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 and, yeah. and, and figure it out that way, right? Because it's easy to think about yeah. it going, oh, it's a bit ugly, but like, is it worth it being pretty if it's not yeah. giving you that extra return? And what's your return on investment? And how long will it take for you to make that money back over time, Mm. depending on how much money you're putting into it? I mean, this comes back to the podcast you and I did on the land to asset ratio Mm. side of things. You know, I like the idea of with the renovated properties, if it makes sense to buy in particular areas where the land is, you know, worth less than the asset. And we're getting onto a whole nother topic here, but buying a property that's pretty run down at the very beginning, adding a very small amount of money into it and sprucing it up to the levels of the other ones on the, on the nice street that you're buying on, you know, you're going to add, and I'm, I'm doing this on the, on the video that we're on now, but some people will be listening, but you're going to add like this much and get this much back in a lot of cases if done correctly. The first one was about two centimeters and then there was about 45 centimeters. (laughs) Um, but as an example, you guess we have real life examples. I uh, purchased a property uh, maybe eight years ago now in rural New South Wales. I needed a good cash injection to my portfolio. I bought this property for God at the time must have been around three twenty. It was a house yep. or three bedroom house for three twenty. Completely original. Um, I ended up spending. 20 to 30 K on a good renovation. I added another bathroom. I added another bedroom. I redesigned the layout. My, oh my God, like this was probably one of the best outcomes I had. I mean, my rent went from 190 to 410 a week. Gee. And the value of the property went from that 220, 230 mark up to 300,000. Right. So that allowed me to, pull that equity out that I just spend, spent, basically end up in ground zero again and go do something else. Mm. And I was getting more um, rental income. It was giving me, it was totally covering every single expense in every single way and then putting some money in my bank account every month as well. Nice. Yeah, nice. So yeah. G- going back to that example where we're talking about, you know, something that's a little bit tighter, but let's say the market is not really appreciating it in a renovated form. Maybe there's an oversupply of, of properties that are that are rented, renovated at a at a higher price, and you're really not going to get that 
premium because you know there's not that many rundown ones and yeah. they're cheaper and you've people want to have that right? margin yeah you've got to have that margin for it to be worth it look more times than not you'll be able to force force some sort of capital growth i guess you'd say you'll be able to force some sort of value it's just about doing it efficiently not overcapitalizing on the costs that you're spending mm. and making sure that you know try and do a stress test or see where am i going to end up and is this worth putting this money into this particular property at this yeah. particular time. And if we yeah. run the numbers and we decide a reno is not the right way to go, what are some of the other yeah. levers that we can pull uh, to, to get the, the property firing a little bit harder? Yeah, so I guess the other the other parts of that are those other two quadrants uh, along, you know, gearing and cash flow. Yep. So those are things like the rental income and the expenses. And then the other side of that is um, – is, is your specialty. And that is obviously the depreciation, the tax benefits, and, and that's more on the, the savings side, yes. I guess you'd say. But all of these things are like this web and they're all kind of linked to each other, right? I yep. mean, the rental income might be linked to the improvements you've done yep. or the rental income might be linked to the kind of yield that the suburb is, is performing for the area that you've chosen for that capital growth side of things. They're all kind of linked, but such a basic thing that people can look at doing is with their expenses. And this is one of the conversations I was having with my client this morning. Look at your expenses. What are the outgoings? You've got, you know, your landlord insurance. Um, you know, most things you can't change, like water, council rates, um, those things you can't really change. Strata, you can't really change unless maybe you get onto the strata committee and try and, I don't know, twist some, twist some arms or something. But other than that, you can get different quotes for insurances. You can get quotes for your property management and see if you can be a little bit more efficient with the expenses side of things, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose uh, as in with a lot of things, sometimes you get what you pay for. Sometimes you pay a premium and you're not getting that extra service. So it's worth asking that question, you know, if I'm paying a bit more than the market rate for property Is managers, what am I getting what get what am I getting out of it? Yeah. And what about going back to that original point where you're you're a person uh, such as you are and, and myself? Uh, how do you, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> how do you earn more money and save more money? I mean, these sound like sort of silly questions, but like there, yeah. there, it's something that I think is is perhaps underutilized or underthought of from a, a a property investor's point of view. Yeah, there there are so many layers to this. I mean, some very basic things about um, you know earning more and saving more. Things like having an offset account, if it's right for you, speaking to your mortgage broker, is my mortgage performing the way that I want it to? Is there a better option out there? Mm. And it's shopping around. Shop around for valuations when you're pulling out equity to see the value of your property. ANZ might say your property is worth 600000 and CBA might say it's worth six thirty. All of a sudden, you have 30000 more equity. Like there are so many ways, but really we've got the value of the property and then how it's performing from a cash flow perspective. So getting quotes and looking at what's in place and being able to determine which of these things is changeable mm -hmm. and which of these things do I have some sort of influence over and how far can I push them? Mm. I guess you say. And when it comes to pushing things, when you're building a portfolio at some point in time, perhaps early on, but definitely towards uh, your acquisition phase, you're going to be in a game of finance, right? So it's really important to make sure that every decision you're making is going to make you the best looking on paper, right? Yes. And you also want to make sure that the next property you buy or the one after or the one over after, like I always see people's property portfolios as like a little family. They all have to complement each other because mm. they affect each other because they affect your finances mm. at the end of the day. So you can't have a plethora of negatively geared properties that are great for your tax or great from a capital growth perspective, but aren't really bringing you any good cash flow. Eventually you're going to get to the breaking point where you're like, I can't sustain all these properties because I'm putting all this money into my portfolio. So you've got to have an injection of cash. Mm. So all the properties need to complement one another. And that is also going to help the performance of them. So even if you're not 
if you have one like that's performing really, really not well, for example, but you've only had it for a short period and you really want to, you know, see the growth of that over time and it's a long-term game in property, maybe you want to see how your other properties can help kind of like support that property Mm. until it starts building up a bit more. Because sometimes, let's be honest, we can do everything by the book, tick all these all these tips that we're saying off and the property's still kind of shit and we, we don't really know what to do with it at that point. Yep. So that's when you kind of rely on the support of the other properties in your portfolio. Do something with them and have them kind of all support each other like a little little family, I guess you'd say. I like that. I was listening to yeah. a, a keynote from a fighter pilot last night and he said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And even though these properties aren't people, they they yeah. are a team, right? They do need to help They're each other. Yeah, They're exactly. Individual businesses. And we are the umbrellas, right? So we are this big corporation and they're all the little entities underneath and they all need to be working together as a team even though they're individuals and they're all they're all in different states and they're all doing their all their own thing and they all have different little personalities they have to work as a team to help us so that we don't go broke and so that in 10 years time we look back and see think how much look at all the wealth that i've made from all of us working together Mm. on this team I like that. I mean, we are we are at risk of going very deep in metaphor, right? But yeah. if, but if, if if you're if you're I love a good metaphor. Yeah, if 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 you're if you're selling garments and your underpants line is just it's just tanking, you know, you don't want it to yep. you don't want it to sink your your jackets, right? Assuming that no. there would be a company that makes jackets and underpants, I'm obviously you can tell by looking at me, I'm not a fashionista, but, <laughs> but it works, right? Works as a metaphor. <laughs> It works. And um, that's why, you know, uh, it's good to have diversification as well. People always talk about have diversification when you're looking at investing, whether it's not only getting into property, maybe getting into shares or maybe getting, maybe you want to buy some car spaces. Maybe you want to buy, separate your property portfolio into different states. And then you've got, you know, different rules around land tax and things like that. that. There's all these different layers and they make up this big web of performance, yes, so yeah. to say. So, um, sorry, go for it. I was just going to say, um, in 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 closing, I would really love you to sort of wrap it all up and bring it all back together because yeah. we've 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 travelled a lot of distance around this. We podcast. have. Here's another. <laughs> I knew here's another happen, Mike. It always happens with you. <laughs> I know, and we not we don't even have a Shiraz that's getting us uh, off track. No, but. no, we don't. But I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Yeah, look. Um, some some hot tips for people like there's just we could branch off into you know ten different topics from this conversation because um, there's so much to be explored here. But I guess the big things for people to think about you know um, do things outside of your comfort zone and things that you're not familiar with, ensuring that you have the right team of people to help you, yep. and ensuring that you're making the right decisions along the way. Don't just go and do something that's uncomfortable because you're feeling adventurous. Make calculated decisions when you're going through this process. And having someone like yourself, Mike, you know, quantity surveyors, a good accountant, a good lawyer, all these people on your team are going to be able to help you improve the property's performance or your portfolio's performance. So that's, that's one thing. Um, another thing to think about is I'm big on the education as you are. And I think it's really important for people to understand what is happening in the background. What do these things mean? You know, I have all these really professional people advising me to do X, Y, Z to help with my situation, but do I understand it well Mm. enough? And I, I think that it's really important for people to understand the functions and the drivers of performance of properties as well as they can without going and doing a degree or anything like that. Yeah. Because that'll allow you to make informed decisions with your team and with the people you're speaking to. Um, obviously push boundaries, you know, forget about what's, what's very normal. I always say like, forget what's normal, look at what's possible and try and push those boundaries and what's right for you. But I guess from a very general action perspective, quotes, shop around, do all that for expenses and just explore your options within your parameters as much as you possibly can. Those are my big tips. 
I love it. And I think the, these are these are t- the great tips, not just when, say, interest rates are biting you or the economy's looking yeah. a little bit sketchy. This is something that you could be reviewing on a regular basis. So you've given us a, well, a quadrant and a fantastic... A quadrant. A quadrant. I didn't expect a quadrant. Have to trademark that one. <laughs> but you've given us a great roadmap on, on how to go <laughs> through, through this process, Kimberly. So thanks very much for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Love it. We'll do it again soon. Sounds good.